Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Abby Kingdon Smith and I'm the Savory Global Network Coordinator. And I want to say a quick thank you to everyone who's joining us today. We are live streaming this, this Q&A session on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So the focus of our conversation today is to talk to a variety of Savory accredited professionals about becoming a Savory accredited professional and why you would do that. And what does that mean to be that? What does it do for your career? What can you do with this? I get this question a lot as the Savory Global Network Coordinator, and I thought it's time we have this conversation. So we're gonna do that today. I'd like to introduce you first to our panelists. First, we have Precious Piri from Zimbabwe. Welcome, Precious. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Abby. Hi, everyone. Hi. We have Derek and Dudu from Turkey. Hello, everyone. Hi, Derek. We have Helen Lewis from Queensland, Australia. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Hi, Helen. We have R Ricardo Aguirre from Arizona in the United States. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Ricardo. We have Elena Michael from Utah in the United States. Good morning, afternoon, wherever everybody is. <laughs> Hi, Elena. And we have Pablo Borelli from Argentina. Hello, and all of Hello Hi, everyone. Pablo. Welcome. And all of these amazing people are Savory accredited professionals working to practice holistic management, to teach holistic management in their region in the world. And a lot of them teach across countries and have been in very, very different places. I think Derekin, for example, is in Sweden at the moment, as is Ricardo. So they're working in many different environments on the brittleness scale, as we say, in, in holistic management. So really honored to be with these fine people today and wanted to, to talk a little bit first about how to become a Savory accredited professional and what that is. And a, a accredited, an AP stands for an accredited professional. That means that you are qualified to teach the holistic management body of knowledge that is shepherded and governed and facilitated by the Savory Institute. It means that you can teach in your um, region of the world through a Savory Hub. And Savory Hubs are, are these partners of the Savory Institute around the world that are locally based, locally led, and they are the ongoing support for land managers, pastoralists, farmers, ranchers in their region of the world. And every Savory Hub that offers an accredited holistic management course that needs to be taught by an accredited professional because we want that body of knowledge of holistic management to stay very um, true and focused to the principles. Um, that also qualifies you to be involved in Savory Institute projects that we operate across the globe. We go first to our network to find our partners in these projects. And you, there's, it opens up opportunities for consulting, there's also another um, accredited professional uh, entity type that's called an EOV monitor. Most of the content that we're focused on here today will be on the educator as a holistic management educator. Um, the global network is very strong. We're, we're ending the year with 52 hubs. We have 160 accredited professionals throughout the globe. We operate in 30 countries. More than 14,000 people have been trained since the Savory Institute started, and more than 15 million hectares of land have been impacted. So in order to become an accredited professional, you need to go through the training that um, is required to become one. So you need to, to take all of the planning procedure courses. So that includes the holistic management fundamentals, plan grazing, holistic land planning, holistic financial planning, and ecological monitoring. When you take those courses through a Savory Hub, then you're now ready to become an AP. You take an exit interview and you will be able to then become um, an AP. There's a whole nother requirement of classes to take to become an EOV monitor, but we're not gonna focus on those today. I am here to answer those questions about those as well. Just know that when you are an AP, you are, that's an umbrella term for both educators and monitors and verifiers within EOV. Educators of holistic management, monitors and educator, monitors and verifiers in EOV. So this is the process. You take your courses, you, you apply to take your exit interview, you pass that one, and then there's an annual accreditation fee that each AP 
pays so that they can have the curriculum, training materials, and other IP. You're also connected to all the accredited professionals, hub leaders, and other Savory Network members across the globe so that we can share our learnings and accelerate our work together. And the beautiful thing that, that um, you gain by being an AP is that you're the ones who are making the difference. We call them the boots on the ground of the network. So you're the ones that are able to take bare ground and turn it into a flourishing grassland and reverse all the, the complex problems of, of desertification, like um, poverty and uh, insecurity and climate change. All of those can be reversed through your work. So um, with that, I want to turn it over to our panelists so that we can learn about their stories and why they decided to join this program. And then we'll have some specific questions for them that I get all the time. So I really wanna hear their answers to those questions. And then we'll open it up to everyone so that you can ask questions of your own for these amazing panelists. So I'd like to start with Precious. Precious, would you like to tell us your story? Hi, Abby. Hi, Hi everyone. My name is Piri. I'm located in Zimbabwe, in the Wange region, particularly in Korea Falls. And um, I'm so glad to be here and really glad to have uh, to share my story, original, in um, the community curriculum. So I work with communal spaces of different kinds. So I'm just going to share a little bit. Um, my involvement um, includes working with Agro Pastoral and Pastoral. Agro Pastoral uh, is helping us also include farmers that grow crops where I work in uh, mostly in Zimbabwe, most of my community is crop and we also take care of livestock. So it's a landscape um, approach also taking into consideration the issue of growing crops and we have as who are mostly into livestock rearing and husbandry and they manage massive lands and the dynamics in this environment are very different. Um, so I'm so glad to be in AB and I'm going to share a little bit of my experiences. Um, I think I was once fully working how in Bible called the Africa Center Management that's right, all the knowledge uh, that I have and all the thinking processes that go on with holistic management. And um, so I decided to then be an architect professional because, to be honest, I find it's one of the most sensible things to do and um, an opportunity to be an accredited professional to me was a no-brainer. I, I just had to be um, this amazing community. Um, so I'm just the, the few things that I, I think would interest some people that want to train communal uh, curriculum. And the reason why I decided I wanted to be an active professional because I come from a region that's really vulnerable in terms of land degradation and social instability. And uh, my personal background as well really caught me in a state to answers to special issues of poverty and purity and sovereignty. So this is more uh, important uh, even in my personal space because I used poverty firsthand uh, growing up with my grandmother in one of the communities here in Wangi. Um, being an accredited professional really influences my thought process in general. And I think as an accredited professional, I first of all have my holistic context. My own vision, my own values of what I want to see when I work with communities, or engage with the people that I love so much, we are good people, and that influences how you think and the amount of integrity that's made in this work with all the NGO legacy that we have currently in Nigeria. There's lots of poverty, and you have the hit and run, was, I'll use that word, where people just come eat and the processes are not very well thought out even if they are, but usually leave people at a far worse place than where they found them. And to really and, um, what's going on right now in the communities, it's very difficult because suddenly they are also just uh, positioned for just receiving donations and sometimes people powerless don't have answers to the problem here. And so to bring that message of hope that we actually have um, um, so that's 
And um, honestly, we have to keep hiring ourselves and our work and the fact we carry the solution. Um, um, okay, I'm seeing that someone's doing really well. I'm so sorry about that. Um, but then I'll just continue in the meantime. Um, so I the other thing of that I'm really involved in a diverse environment, people with lots of different social issues. You know, we always say, we always start jokingly saying, you know, to find raising or to engage tools of management is not a problem, not so much, but in the communal space, the challenge is how to actually get people to and so being in the communal curriculum, it's such an advantage because the materials are broken down to suit contextual situations in terms of social and economic opportunities of different communities. And the other thing, the AUP, we call them AUP, so accredited professional, um, you get to learn from others, of others, you tap into the knowledge of others. And every agency is a chance to learn when you engage with people. You learn something every day, and the thing is, this work is not easy. But having a professional is like having a community of energy as where you keep seeing others and doing, and keeping the excitement going. So that's what I'll stop at now. I'll just wait for questions. Thank you so much. So much. I love the description of. APs as, as a network of energy boosters to help you do your work. That was amazing. The other thing I just learned from Precious to demonstrate what she's saying is this hit and run NGO. My goodness, that's such a great description. That is the opposite of what we want to be in the communities that we work with. Thank you. That's a great description. And leaving people worse off than, they, than we started, that's definitely not the impact we want to have in the world. Thank you, Precious, so much. I'd like to introduce now Derekin to help to tell his story to us. Hey there, I had a little disconnection for a second, but I'm back. Yeah. Hello, Abby. Uh, my name is Durukan, Durukan Dudu, once again. Um, I am from Turkey. I am the co-founder of the uh, Turkish hub of Sabre Institute in Turkey. And um, for me to become an AP was a uh, kind of an outcome of our hub process. So I should maybe note at this point that I started this journey in 2012 as a urban person, you know, city boy, as they say. So uh, I didn't have any education or knowledge or experience on agriculture, yet alone uh, livestock. I always uh, make the joke of saying, you know, I, I was not able to really distinct a goat from a sheep when I started this journey. And then um, when we started the hub, the first thing we needed to do was to become, of course, uh, to get the knowledge. Actually, to start the hub was uh, the, the first thing was to get the knowledge. And that's how my uh, accredited professional journey started. Uh, but throughout the process, um, I started working for international organizations like FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations, and other organizations um, throughout the world. And as of today, I've been working in uh, Turkey, Afghanistan, Egypt, Israel, Mongolia, uh, Sweden, where I am at the moment, and um, some other countries as well, but mainly these ones. Um, and and the accreditation process is, uh, you know, there are many accreditation process in the world that every organizations have to sort out the level of knowledge or experience that their members or people affiliated are um, kind of classified or it's it just make it easy for um, for uh, external parties, like for instance, a, com a company or organiz organization that comes into the community, into the community of Saver Institute and say, hey, we have a project in this place or in that place. We, we have an idea, we have an initiative and would you help us? Um, and so in my process, being an AP um, uh, helped that as well. So it actually helped our hops in Turkey, Anatolian grasslands expansion 
in Turkey, but also in Middle East countries, and as, as I said, even, even to the Asian countries. Um, and as of now, it, as, as AB explained, there are different levels also in accreditation. In 2016, I, I, get, um, um, I became field professional. And in 2021, in the beginning of this year, actually, I became a master field professional. So it's in a way, I, I believe it's, it's a very hope giving and also strong story because if I, after I was 25, learned about livestock, soil, plant grazing, but more importantly, even uh, how to manage complexity that includes land and livestock, but all the social dynamics, economics, opportunities, challenges, log jams, as we call, how to build teams around projects or how to build uh, ecosystems of people and stakeholders around countries and places. Um, if I was able to do that as a person who really had no background at all on on agriculture and la like land management, I think it's a it's a very strong signal and message to everyone who would like to be involved because it's such process, and uh, holistic management is is helping that tremendously by giving the abilities to read the land, the to read the ecosystems, and to start seeing different patterns where we as human beings can involve and can can make a difference, can 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 play with the leverages within the uh, communities and the economics and, and the whole complexity around it to to start regenerating the land, but also with, with that the communities as well. So I shall leave here. I shall leave Thank that at this point. I love that. Thank you, Derek. And from city boy to master field professional, Derek is <laughs> number three in the entire world. So amazing story and, and fills me with hope and energy. Thank you so much. Helen, would you like to tell us your story, please? Sure. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Helen Lewis, uh, based in Warwick, Queensland, Australia. I'm a farmer and an accredited professional and also the founder of Decision Design Hub, um, really focusing on the values and the desired future and the decision-making that holistic management gives people. Um, when I did the practitioner training in Australia with Bruce Ward, um, I was the executive officer for an ag adv advocacy body with my, and my previous role had been a ministerial advisor. Um, I remember saying to Bruce, oh, after we went through the decision making, this is how you actually make good policy. So it's it, it was just absolutely perfect for my my previous lived experience, and it actually really cemented my understanding of of a change in way in which we could actually make better policy, um, and and better decisions. Um, and I, I really want to make a difference, um, solve the root cause, um, and enable people, the environment, and prosperity to thrive. Um, I love collaboration and being creative in utilising existing mechanisms for implementing decisions so and policy and initiatives so we don't get stuck in duplication and silo thinking um, or try and reinvent the wheel. Um, holistic management enables us to find the common ground for groups of people um, or they, you know, enables the common ground to be, you know, to be unearthed by people in the group. Um, and we also it also creates um, a bigger bigger picture and a bigger uh, motivation than one individual. Um, it fixes the root cause and checks our head, our heart, the future, the present, people, environment, and prosperity. Um, and then the post decision making process um, is the monitoring, and that keeps our eye on the ball, which is great. I guess how it's impacted and influenced me um, with HM knowledge, I can focus on what matters most, and I think that's really um, key. I see opportunity everywhere, and I sometimes get caught up in the FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, but then checking my holistic context, it really brings me back to what's really important um, and keeps me on track. Uh, I noticed that after completing my holistic management training, uh, the um, my life actually moved from highs and lows to very, very calm ebbs and flows. Uh, so that was a really big shift, um, I think, in my life. And then it is humbling and honour and an honour to actually teach people and and take people through this process for them to find their clarity and give them um, confidence in their decision making and then a sense of calm. 
Uh, that's a really great part of what we do. Um, and I think it also provides a leadership capacity as an AP because we see things differently. Um, and we're very good at, um, because we're curious by nature and um, and the training sort of incites curiosity because uh, you've got to find that root cause and, and get into it, get onto it. And um, and as a result, I think it's noticed in the public um, because we, t- we come with a completely different approach, which is proactive uh, and really positive. Um, unique ways I'm using my accreditation is um, probably three things. I'm um, embarking on offering an updated decision-making process and policy-making process for, um, for decision-makers and policy-makers. Uh, through Decision Design Hub and um, also incorporating the ESG um, require and you know environmental, social, and corporate governance, um, just so that they can and helping organisations just get better at that and move towards the circular economy, making decisions about what options they pick, all those things, uh, and then also helping um, environmental organisations and businesses use the policy process. Well, um, Chair of Ag Force the Drought Policy. We we created an ag business cycle, uh, which actually really helps, considers the social, environmental and economic actions that we need to take um, in each phase, the normal, the drying, the dry and the recovery, uh, to maximise our preparedness for the next phase in our ag business cycle. And also um, allows us then to, allows people to go into drought later and come out sooner because they've actually been considering those social, economic and environmental issue factors. And um, then again, as general manager of the Outback Way, which is the um, um, Australia's uh, Route 66 right across Australia, and uh, we have a holistic context and we bring, we collaborate with over 26 organisations, three tiers of government, and just recently it's been noted as um, the Outback Highway Development Council is one of the most collaborative, um, effective um groups in Australia, so uh, we're building infrastructure in Australia. So um, that that was, um, and I believe it's testament because we have our context and we're moving, we're always moving towards that and and, and in line with our values as an organisation. So those are the, the, the um, areas and I just really recommend people embark on it. Um, there is just so much support and you don't have to come up with a clean slate. You get, you get a lot of resources, but I think it's also really important for people to, to develop their own resources as well. But yeah, I, I really highly recommend it. Thanks. So, oh, there, here I am. Hi, Helen. I love the highs and lows to ebbs and flows. That is so beautiful. It makes mm. me think of a river that has really steep cut banks and then it over mm. time healing, it just yeah, ebbs and right. flows. Mm. Just, mm. So, that's amazing. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Good. Ricardo, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to share your story with us as well. Thanks, Abby. Yes, my name is Ricardo Aguirre. Um, I am the director of the Arizona Savory Hub, uh, renamed Drylands Alliance for Addressing Water Needs. Um, my occupation is civil engineering. Uh, with actually a focus in flood control engineering. So it's that arm of civil engineering that focuses on the hydrologic cycle. Um, Of course, I'm an AP along with everybody else on the panel, Uh, but I'm also a professional engineer in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. I'm also certified in water harvesting. Um, I... uh, decided to become an AP really uh, because I started a family and I was beginning to ask what kind of impacts uh, my designs and civil engineering were having on the environment. And so I started to ask some of those tough questions and refer back to what I was taught from professors in college and began to realize I didn't like what I was hearing and also wanted to instill agrarian values in my son. And so I started to explore regenerative agriculture and came across permaculture and then stumbled upon holistic management. And it really suited uh, where it was I wanted to be because it brought me full circle back to my upbringing as a ranch hand and a farm boy almost like a character arc, if you will, um, 
or a hero's journey, if I may be so bold to say. Um, but that's that's really what largely brought me through this path. And then in looking at the practices and methods in holistic management, I realized I was able to scale them up and over in uh, and offer them to the clients that I had in local, state, federal, as well as uh, federal governments, as well as the private sector. Um, and so then that really began to shape um, and impact my career in a way where not only did I reinvent myself, but quite literally in the process of reinventing the entire profession. Uh, civil engineering, as taught in the United States, as well as around the world, is this practice of simplifying the flow of water and centralizing resources. Of course, the chief resource being water. And it really began to compel me to look at how nature managed resources compared to how, let's say, the industrial age uh, prompted engineering, particularly land connected projects like civil engineering, which has only been around for 140 years to manage water. And so basically, I began to realize that I was taught only a 140 year old dogma uh, compared to a 650 billion year old perfected system, that being nature, and began to realize that this, what I was doing was degrading the environment with my infrastructure designs and flood control. And I find it interesting that um, we create industries now as a result of degrading organic systems, whether it's the human body or of course uh, the environment. So that's a big way that it's impacted my career is to offer land management as an alternative to traditional civil engineering, which basically there's only three tools, a pipe, a channel or a hole in the ground to manage water. Now, what you see in front is uh, some before and after pictures of the work that we're doing in Arizona to demonstrate some of the results. But also on the left is uh, how Arizona is, a is an illustration of how Arizona is plagued with dust. So really what engineers have been asked to do is, is solve these symptoms of desertification, but all that engineer, civil engineers have been um, providing is Band-Aid relief. And what holistic management does through the AP program is really attack uh, the root issues of the watershed um, the way nature had intended. And so that is what it is that we're exploring to do. We've got now uh, large land management contracts with the New Mexico Department of Transportation, for example. We're on their dust mitigation on call. So that just gives you a taste that it's not just excess runoff, which is a fancy way of saying flooding, uh, but there's other symptoms of desertification, such as dust storms that we're facing in Arizona, wildfires, invasive species, um, soil loss, uh, soil erosion. And so these are basically all symptoms of desertification that engineers were assigned to resolve and quite frankly, failing at it. And so we thought it was very important, uh, myself as an individual, but uh, the company I work for, West Consultants, uh, who I proposed um, embracing uh, my hub and create a nonprofit uh, to begin to charge down this path and uh, begin to influence uh, my community and contemporaries in the space of engineering uh, to uh, to proceed with uh, really nature-based solutions. So that's uh, so I'll leave it at that, uh, Abby. If you want to go on to the next panel. Yeah, thank you so much, Ricardo. Ricardo and I were in Zimbabwe together in 2014 in training, and I feel like every time we have a conversation, I learn something new. And I'm so proud of the work you're doing and very grateful. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. Next is Elena, Michael. Elena, would you like to tell us your story? Hi. Of course, yeah. Um, oh my goodness, so much. And so much is going through my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, where do I start? But um, yeah, as Abby said, um, my name's Elena Michael, and I've had the privilege of um, knowing Abby and being mentored by her for the past uh, three or so years. And, um, and just being able to be connected with the Savory Institute um, since my college career at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo 
which started in 2010, and I was able to take a holistic management course um, in probably my sophomore year, um, which I am pretty sure not many people have the opportunity to do that in their college career. So really, this was just um, a gift that was handed to me, and I want to keep sharing this knowledge and the perspectives, the so-called paradigm shifts um, that were really shared with me when it started in uh, my sheep management production course where we herded sheep and just was a wake-up call to the fact that the, um, the land needs animals and, and that's not something that makes very much sense to people. So. I'll start with a quick story of a recent conversation I had um, with a family member over Thanksgiving. This is where all of your passions come out and you can really speak to them with, with passionate family members. So i um, trying to get my engineer-minded uncle to understand why I would want to take down trees in one part of the world where in, in California, for example, but in another part of the world, we need to grow trees. And so there's this like conflicting sort of management that to a normal person, um, not getting this kind of education or having the paradigms um, around the, the brittleness scale that we learn as accredited professionals, um, that there are different climates and they respond differently if you don't have that, all of what's going on in the world today just doesn't make any sense. Um, where we want to get rid of the excess wood in in places like California, dry climates, um, but we need to plant more trees in places like um, the the wetter climates. So, um, so that allows me being an AP allows me to have those conversations and bring some clarity to the table. Um, and I am also just very passionate from my schooling, um, being starting in animal science and then going into ruminant nutrition in my master's at Cal Poly. I'm very, very passionate about um, the ruminant animal and just the fact that they're walking composters. So that's kind of propelled me from college to now and um, continued my connection with the savory Institute through meeting Abby and having her mentorship and trying to figure out how I can include the principles that I've learned into my life. And so um, as the AP accredited professional um, career started evolving and that opportunity arose, then that seemed to be the best path that I can take. And so um, what it gives me is accountability, being a part of a hub that keeps me, um, keeps me grounded, uh, gives me a place to bounce ideas off of, and then just feeling part of a greater global mission is awesome and really huge, connecting me with a global need. Every part of the world needs to see things in a holistic way whether you have access to land or not, it's people, land, and money that our lives are influencing. Um, and so for me, how I am using this right now is um, I've had a dream of just so many ideas, um, starting my own business, Refont Ventures. So this is kind of a greater vision and mission that I'm starting to address some of the most pressing issues and barriers to people of various lifestyles, no matter how wealthy or poor, if they are an absentee landowner running off doing work all over the world, or they just wanna be a land manager. Um, that's one of the, the things I'm trying to address. And then people my age that are trying to leave their computer jobs, um, a lot of tech people leaving tech, um, but land's too expensive. Or if you're wealthy and able to buy land, but your whole career has had nothing to do with land management, then you have no idea what to do with the land once you get it. So I'm trying to bring all of these people and just uh, together and desires to get back to the land, be more connected, um, have better nutrition, 
and really understanding having a holistic life and what that looks like. Um, so currently what I'm doing with this is uh, I'm working at Utah State University as a research technician, but I'm able to bring in the resources that I have as an accredited professional into some of the research that's going on in universities and with different people, um, ranchers around my area and just being a resource to them. Um, having the accredited professional, uh, the mentorship from my hub, helping in, me in building my business and starting to understand all the pieces that go into that. Um, and as I mentioned, just in conversations with people, helping to shift paradigms. And I am um, a newbie uh, AP for any other young people graduating out of college. Um, it's been a really great journey and kind of stepping into this um, and trying to create something new rather than just the, the job world that's kind of handed to you and you have to, to fit into it. Um, and so uh, currently I've been able to work for a nonprofit farm and applying for grants and um, sharing with them all of the resources that I have as an AP in being able to bring groups together, creating a resilient team that might have um, big goals and helping the team um, in the grant to succeed. So those are just some examples right now. <clears throat> Jelena, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be part of your career and watch you grow and evolve. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. your story with us. Thank you. Last is Pablo Borelli from Argentina. Pablo, we welcome your story. Hello, hello everyone. Well, I have a, lo a longer story. I, I, I am an agronomist. My name is Pablo Borelli. I'm an accredited professional and the hub leader, Dine Hub, and. Um, I've worked for grasslands research since my the early 80s and um, I'm from southern Patagonia and uh, had the chance to realize the overwhelming degradation that my land had I I decided to devote my life my career to solving try to fix that and try to help people to stop degradation and um and i went the wrong the wrong direction for a long time from uh, from the uh paradigms of rangeland i read everything i had and uh and i went almost for three decades on the wrong direction just to uh, to evaluate the grasslands and uh and just stocking rates in continuous growth I, I did that for almost 30 years. We know uh, not a single success. So I was killing my patients with my medicine. And, and um, so we, we arrived to think management by failure. We, uh, we didn't see a TED talk. It wasn't there in 2008. We didn't see a TED talk. We didn't know almost what was holistic management about. And, um, but we knew that we were failing. The farmers that followed our prescriptions were almost in bankruptcy with their land looking very bad. So, so the came out of, uh, we started, we, we brought Jim Hart to do a two day workshop in 2007 that blew my mind. And on, on the next year, uh, we brought Brian Maru to Argentina and we started the first farm, which was happened to be my partner's farm on, at, at uh, the tip of uh, Patagonia. And it was so mind blowing to see what happened when we started to plan our grazings that really uh, I, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't find uh, something better to do than devoting what it was left from my career to uh, management. And it was a, a very fast uh, learning curve, with a lot of mistakes too, because there was no clear 
knowledge about how big flocks of sheep in in Patagonia. There was a direction we learned the hard way by committing mis. But after that, we developed uh, a community, Latina, a learned community, a, a practice that started practicing holistic management everywhere. And uh, so we are working in, in the country and we organized a regeneration school in which we are training around 200 people per year. And uh, being an AP is, is a very, it's an essential part of it. We, we can do this because we are part of a global community. We have the support from the Savory Institute. We have the right, the materials that are so valuable. So while we, we are, uh, probably we are uh, boosting holistic management in this region on behalf of the Institute, creating this learning community we don't know yet, we need to know more. And uh, to know more, we need to do things because you learn by doing more than reading and more than talking. So we are a practice. We have uh, more than 100,000 hectares in around 100,000 hectares in the northern part of the Qatar using EOV as a, as a metric and they are practicing holistic management and uh, and we are trying to measure the recent learn as fast as we can and now our work is uh, becoming noticed by, by farmer organizations and government and it is becoming more more visible as this we are clearly uh, in a in a different of the earth more conscience there is fear from what is coming and more urge to action. So it's a great moment to be an AP and have an organization that could um, help you to, to do the job. I think this is the most rich, the most uh, satisfying piece of my career. I, whenever you see land coming back to life uh, or when a family or, or a young, uh, professional says this is was before and after this changed my life there is no money that can pay that that is pure satisfaction pure fulfillment of what it is in our hearts and which is written in our holistic context so i um, i wish young young persons to do to leave a footprint to deal with big challenges, it should be. So much. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And it is so true to be around someone whose lives has changed or be on land that's regenerating. There's no other feeling that can compare to that. It's amazing. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite everyone else back in. We have the, I have a question for each of you. And after I ask the specific person that question, if anyone wants to add more, please do. These are questions that I get every day, and I'd love to hear your answers to them and have them recorded for the future. So I'd like to start with Helen. So Helen, imagine I'm a person, start there, who has significant career experience already in a field related to agriculture, perhaps a government agency or a farm or a rancher, and I'm ready to change my career path to focus on regenerative agriculture. Becoming a savory AP seems like a good way to accomplish this, but I don't know enough. I'm curious and cautious. I want to make sure it'll, it will accelerate my career goals and be a beneficial move. What advice do you have for me? Well, I really recommend uh, the person does a, a even a basic holistic management course, a practitioner level, um, if that's available. And uh, so they, they actually can create their own holistic context. And then they can actually start evaluating the way in which they want to work with it to, towards their context. Um, being a holistic management educator, you can you know you can choose to be training people all over the place, lots of travel, being away from home, but that may not suit people. Um, and so um, having a, a chance to then do it locally, online, or 
Um, and so, so there's a whole heap of different ways in which educators deliver the training and I think it just needs to be the best possible version for the person specifically. And I guess I um, would also recommend that um, that you don't have to start, start from scratch, as I said a little bit earlier, that there's lots of resources available and so people can actually get information and you've got, da- you know, you've got your PowerPoints and, you, you know, however you'd like to present or um, practical uh, tips and tricks. Uh, and so uh, you will develop, and I really recommend people developing their own resources in their training because I think it's really, it, it's clearly important uh, you know, people are passionate about it when they've got their own words in their own language about what it means to and how to how to impart the knowledge. Um, I still bring out my old trusty tetrahedron, you know, from back in 1999, you know, and um, it's still going strong and I keep on taping it up, but it's, it's what I pivot on in regards to the ecosystem processes um, and how they are a whole and that you know, one side gets affected, everything gets affected. So so those are the sorts of tools I'm thinking about and, and just getting people excited about their own materials. Um, it's, it's because managing holistically is fundamentally a decision-making shift, the opportunities are diverse um, and I recommend that they focus on the area that they, they can probably make the biggest impact. Um, so you can help family farms, local businesses, organisations, boards, land care groups, local councils, government agencies, political parties, but to get started, I suggest people look at their circle of influence um, and circle of concern. So um, what and who you can influence in your community right now, um, and as you grow your influence, your circle of concern will shrink. So that's really uh, in a nutshell, but just really hone in on on what you can do now. Thank you so much, Helen. I love that you start with holistic context, which is the essence of holistic management. Thank you so much. Anyone, would anyone else like to add anything? All right, wonderful. Elena, this question is for you. Say I'm a 25 year old and I just graduated from college. I do not have a lot of career or field experience, but I'm passionate about regenerative agriculture and holistic management. I want to gain hands on experience and learn everything I can about how to really do this work. What is the most important action I can take next to advance my career goals? Who should I meet? Where should I go? What should I read? Oh, goodness. Lots of good questions. Um, My first thought in this, which this has kind of been a journey I've gone down recently um, since coming off of a full-time job, was being financially free. And I think that allows us to um, really do this soul searching that we need to do or career path finding um, because in, when you're in that position, you're able to have the flexibility that you need and not be burdened and pressured to feel like, um, to not be able to think clearly. So um, so that's part of what I do is just connect people with a lot of free resources and people that are out there. Um, so, and you can definitely contact me to get in touch with some of those resources. Um, and so that would be my really first suggestion. I look back on where I've been and, um, some of the big steps I took in college, just like sitting down in the Dean's office and saying, I am looking for scholarships. And I walked out and had a personal scholarship or being on the track team and saying, what do I have to do? So those are some big, just taking those big steps and being bold and brave. Um, and and so you may be in one of two boats right now. You may um, be clear on your goals, whether you're in college or just getting out of college. Um, if you are clear on your goals, then write them down and find a mentor and seek accountability. And then leverage what other people are doing. Make sure that you look and see what else is going on. For me, the Savory Institute is here and this program gives me access to a lot of other people that are doing similar things, um, already have the global connections, are like-minded. And so really um, trying not to reinvent the wheel with, with things that you know that you're interested in. However, if you're in the second boat and you're really uncertain of what you want to do yet, um, but you know there's definitely something more out there for you, I would say um, definitely first have your morning routine, take care of you, 
meditate, pray, do whatever you need to do during that really precious time to figure out what your why is. Um, and then, and give yourself, maybe you're finishing an academic career, um, give yourself time to travel and um, connect with people, meet and see what other people's why are. And then you can start to shape what makes sense to you. Um, so that, that would be some of my suggestions there. Um, in terms of who you should meet, just be around people that inspire you make sure that you surround yourself with the um, people that you want to be like, because you will become what they are like. Um, and then um, and then, where should you go? I would say, um, if you're interested in holistic management, I would say expose yourself to different climate types so that you can see the different um, types of climate out there, see what's going on, see how um, the management is is affecting those different climates and how that works. And um, then putting yourself in places with many resources and connections, places that give you the opportunity to teach and be a resource to others um, so that that keeps pushing you on and growing. And then uh, a couple books I have, um, our personality isn't permanent. It's a really good one I recently listened to. How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, Daring Greatly, Limitless, Braiding Sweetgrass, and Start With Why. Awesome. What a list. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Elena. Is there anything anyone else would like to add? All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elena. Precious, the next question is for you. Uh, please tell us about working with communities who are practicing holistic management. Can you tell us more about the communal holistic com management curriculum and what makes it unique? It's Abby. How could I learn? It's, it's okay. Um, sorry, you can continue. I thought you that. It's okay. Oh, yeah, no, that's, it. that's the questions. So you need to me to repeat them? It's all right. Just okay. my video in case um, it helps people hear me better. Okay, great. Um, because of the whole connectivity thing. Um, so, yes, um, I've really been fortunate to be involved um, with working using the communal curriculum. So, this was developed in 2010 at the Africa Center for Holistic Management, which um, is basically the first ever hub. And thankfully, we're also working with um, communities like uh, we learn this community owned and um, decisions are taken in collectives. Um, so we designed this curriculum, thankfully of the members that really pioneered in designing a curriculum that we called holistic land and livestock management, which is basically holistic management that's simplified to then really touch on what's also important or what you can call maybe economic drivers for these communities that we partner with and work with. Um, so this then is like sort of an adapted information, but with the same principle in the same framework, but mostly really simplified that um, Whoever is training or facilitating a community, they all really look at what's culturally relevant in that space or how is the community socially organized, who are the key persons or key individuals who can carry on the work and move forward because it's so focused on being community-led, co-learning and co-creating with the communities using a language that is relevant to that space. Um, including even translation. Some of the words don't mean the same thing in local languages. So a local person is very important to um, then take uh, this from these communities. So you have different um, ways of mobilizing. You have uh, the modules that are giving out holistic management 
um, detailed content. And then you have what we call the foundational modules, which are mostly around ecological literacy and bringing in the importance and, uh, of system processes and understanding the area that you manage, but all really broken down. And it really depends on you know, the facilitator or you as an AP, the point that you're dealing with, what that you're, that you're dealing with, what are those issues, and holistic management is broken and the decision making framework is the same and really it is the main because that's the ground for even starting any dialogue um so you create holistic context and regardless of the political views or clan differences everybody wants the same thing so this doesn't make it easy because these are people that go much but then this is a message of hope and in, in most Cases. I feel like role also create the excitement around possibility, oh, and um, oh. thankfully working here um, in the Zimbabwe, we have a center for holistic that has resolved to share, to show, and, and and you know like people don't know how to learn right. I think a land that can carry your family for generations is visible when you visit where things have been done uh, well. So it's also good to the Africa Center as a learning site for inspiration to uh, bring those who are heading, to bring leaders, uh, to create these dialogues around the spaces. Um, so, and, and um, just what's unique is the aspect of incorporating other dynamics other than just land management or economic prosperity, you know, the social aspects as well. And I think it really challenges um, me as a person who facilitates as an AP. In every context, there's a different culture. And um, it's been interesting to see how different it is to facilitate this knowledge in, in pastoral communities that have different, and their passions are laid in different spaces, but the materials help you maneuver. That. And yeah, you can actually access uh, training in the communal curriculum through the um, platform, but also the places like the African management that I have done it for ages and there's lots of experience. And I think there's um, lots of other individuals are accredited in the communal curriculum that can be of help. And, and, and I think in, in this space, I think it's part of that from just sharing the experiences. Sometimes you ask each aspect of even the decision making framework, it's different with each group. And um, yeah, and, and sometimes there's no uh, frame, uh, time frame. You couldn't say that, oh, yeah, within six months you'll be done with this because these are living, since these are communities that have their own dynamics. Your role is to understand that you're wearing different hats each time, but more than anything, you're also learning creating together with the communities. So I do think that there's lots of opportunity for each community to be given our curriculum, only if you know how it then applies um, to your different um, or unique environment. Um, yeah, so that I find, I think when you use the communal curriculum, I find that you create relations, um, it's lots of just relations between the people, and um, I'm, one of my favorite things is to create the holistic context. Um, I remember one time uh, when I was working with Monty, there was an issue on, so, you know, we, we creating an environment where people share a generous and are not a page. You know, we could share the surplus. It's not much, so what if we don't have surplus? We do not share. So people start to challenge things that have been going on in the communities. And again, uh, non, not romanticizing anything because it's a lot um, of, of investment in the person of the AP working with each group, but there's always some joy at the end. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Precious, so much. It's incredible. I, I, I find so fascinating the community mobilization aspects and the hurting aspects of the communal curriculum, which are really so applicable everywhere. Uh, it's wonderful that we have that body of knowledge as well. Thank you so much. The next question is for Ricardo. Ricardo, as a civil engineer, how is holistic management part of your projects and work? I think you showed us some of it before, but maybe expand a little bit. 
why was it this so important to make this change in your career? And how has it changed you as a person, a professional, and the outcomes of your projects? Please tell us about maybe one project you're particularly proud of. Okay, thanks, Abby. You know, coming back and being around other APs and hubs, sometimes it compels me to wonder why I'm accepted in the group because I feel like I'm just the odd man out being a civil engineer. And I'm so grateful to be a part of what everybody has expressed um, on the call so far. So the uh, to get to the answers to your questions, I have to say that um, I came into this, like you had indicated, uh, kind of during that second edition of holistic management. And I poured myself into that book. And the subtitle was a framework for decision making. And I really appreciated uh, the essence of what that book had in it because it spoke to me as an engineer. I mean, everything in the book was very engineering centric. And as a result, I've been able to take that vernacular, uh, you know, those, those, um, those precepts that have, that Alan defined and completely overhaul how I approach, uh, my projects. And so that would be, you know, from, from the proposal stage, how I go after a project, I have to write an understanding and approach of the project. And so this idea of a holistic context, understanding the holes under management, you know, the, in, in engineering, you're constantly figuring out who the stakeholders are, who the decision makers are. And so that has really helped me to uh, clarify on an, an approach for the proposal or the procurement stage and articulate uh, myself and my understanding of the project in the face of a prospective client in a way that um, my competitors ha had not before. I mean, it seems like it was just a, a bit random, but um, that's what it is. It's just a framework that has allowed me to really organize my thoughts and how to see the project in a way that even with two degrees in civil engineering, um, I was, I feel like I was ill-equipped until, you know, somebody like Alan put this together and has allowed me to um, really take it and work with it from an engineering perspective. Uh, the second question is why this is important, as I mentioned in my kind of opening comments, is, you know, becoming a father. And as I've said in some, actually many presentations, is the moment my son came into this world, uh, I imagine I had a conversation with him 15 years in the future where he had asked if I knew the environment was degrading and as a civil engineer, was I in a position to do something about it? And of course, I didn't want 15 years later to respond to that question, those questions by saying, uh, yes, I knew and no, um, being in land connected type engineering as civil engineers are, I didn't do anything about it. And so to me, it was, it's about the future. It's about his generation and uh, beyond and making sure that I can look at him in his eyes uh, as well as all of his uh, generation and beyond to be able to feel like I've done everything I could to make this place better than it was when I arrived. And so that's really what, um, you know, why it was important for you to make this change in my career, how it changed. Um, me as a person, you know, I think Pablo said something very profound and it's this uh, learn by doing. You know, engineering, it's looking back at uh, how the industrial moguls have uh, came to create the ind industrial age. Um, it was all by doing, it wasn't by academics, but then somehow the universities took that over and the engineering today really is no hands-on. It's behind the computer and uh, it's not doing it all. It's handed over to construction management uh, or contractors rather. And so this has allowed me to come back into uh, the roots of how I grew up as a farm boy and a ranch hand and really practice. And so to be able to get out in the field and uh, really reflect on the importance as an engineer to be hands-on 
So that's uh, that was very important. And then also the um, just the philosophy of this idea of producing more than I consume. And engineering, unfortunately, uh, at least in the space that I am in, is um, it tends to need to kind of keep this economic engine going without the benefit of looking at um, the purpose of how nature functions. So from a philosophical standpoint, I think that was incredibly important. Um, then uh, finally, I would say that uh, projects that are have been really important or that I'm proud of, I would say, uh, let me just talk about one. So I gave uh, one of the counties in Southern Arizona holistic management training. And I think to me, one of those, the biggest moment was at the last course that I gave where one of the staff engineers from the county uh, came up to me after I put a former project in front of the staff that I had done as a flood control design engineer, and it cost $12 million in another county in, in Arizona. And the watershed, which is basically a piece of land that drains water, um, was about the same size that we were exploring in the county that I'm working with to do a land management project on. And that project was $12 million. And I had estimated in front of the county engineer and her staff that we could probably get as much done. We could probably control more flood water, get more of that water in the ground to recharge the aquifers, solve water quality issues, solve soil erosion issues for probably around $500,000. So we're talking about multi six figure project compared to a $12 million project that's basically just a Band-Aid. And the uh, staff engineer basically, like his eyes just lit up. And he's like, so you're saying to me, and it was really profound because when you attack uh, resource management through the framework of holistic management, and you bring it into this space of engineering and you make that kind of an impression, it, it, it really has been, um, you know, very life changing for me to see the impacts that I've made on uh, local, state, federal government uh, personnel and officials. Uh, the, the, and the other thing I'd have to conclude with, Abby, is just how fortunate that I believe that I'm that I am in, because I know that based on some of the other panelists that came before me, there can be challenges um, to operate uh, an agricultural um, enterprise and to be able to go in and talk to a public official and say that we can save taxpayer dollars by upwards of 80 percent just by using land management and actually restoring watershed function and solving these symptoms of desertification and not spending millions of dollars on symptomatic relief or putting a band-aid on there and so really i feel very grateful and fortunate to be in the position that i'm in because I can, you know, that's that's selling in this space and people are very hungry. Um, these decision makers are very hungry for low cost, high return projects. And so um, to not have to sometimes face uh, maybe what Elena was talking, Elena was talking about in terms of, you know, if you're low on money and how do you get in this space? You know, to be a civil engineer and to walk in and ask for a multi hundred thousand dollars from a government to be able to um, begin to deliver and unpack the, 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 the values of holistic management on a government project that's going to save the government and all of the, the citizens that are being affected, whether it's by dust that are killing motorists on our interstate in Arizona and New Mexico, um, or protecting people from flooding um, or other hazards as a result of uh, the certification and then be able to get paid, you know, the consulting fees that I get paid is, um, you know, I'm not trying to plug myself on that, but it's just like, I, sometimes I have to pinch myself uh, because of the, uh, the, the, um, the space that I'm in and, and how it's worked for me over, it's been a haul and it's been challenging, but over the course of um, what has it been now, seven or eight years uh, since we were in Zimbabwe, 
um, it's starting to pay dividends and we're getting large land management contracts as we continue to offer uh, land management as an alternative to traditional engineering and um, people continue to uh, want more of this. And so we're just, um, yeah, very fortunate. And we continue to look forward to what the future has has in store for us and to be able to invite people, uh, public officials in particular over and uh, begin to see more and more about what we're doing. So, um, yeah, so again, I'm, I'm very proud and very grateful um, to have made this course correction and reinvent myself uh, in this space. Um, and a lot of people that are supporting me at, at the office that I'm running at the company, as well as in the nonprofit, uh, that is the hub. Uh, they're very, they're very excited as well. Uh, so thank you for, uh, thank you for having me um, be able to share my thoughts, Abby. Yeah, can't imagine doing it without you having this conversation without you. So it's so awesome to see and it, it's okay to be successful. It's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> so good to see it. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Uh, Pablo, I have a question for you. What is it like to teach holistic management and EOV as a full-time career across the globe? How many countries and continents have you worked on? What is most rewarding about the work and what is most challenging? Well, we've been working for a long time. Uh, uh, we have the regeneration school. We offered two holistic management training courses five before the pandemic. And after the COVID, we went into uh, online training, virtual training, and it would allow us to really to increase uh, largely our, the, the amount of people trained and of people from other countries to, to take our training. So, um, but uh, we have been training in, in South America, uh, in uh, Bolivia, Peru, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. We did training in Spain, uh, in different parts of Spain, and in Africa and Senegal. And that was an EOV training. And we did EOV trainings in the US. So I've, I've been lucky to be able to travel a lot uh, with, with, uh, with this uh, AP uh, situation and uh, I enjoyed it very much and uh, I met a lot of wonderful people and uh, what I enjoy uh, I'm uh, I focus on camps I enjoy uh, changing lives of people and uh, when I see that um, young professionals that are just coming out of college come come to our trainings and say hey you put it all, all upside down. This is not what I was trained for. I was trained to produce good recipes of fertilizers and agrochemicals. And now you're telling all this stuff and that this changes the whole thing. So those young people taking this course with such a passion, that, that, that is very feeling. And you see, um, I enjoy the, the families that stay on the land because they are having good results and they using holistic management they develop a different relationship with the land and with this difficult to to be in, in balance and uh, to keep uh, other things except this uh, regeneration uh, fury out and uh, stop it. So there is family, there is friends, there is a life, there is things that sometimes you you get those you get those behind because of this passion of um, changing things. So if you if you if you keep in context, it's a joyful life, and uh, I, I will, that is something I would like to share to everyone. I love this. There's so many great quotes from this, this session. If you keep it in context, it's a joyful life. I think that is the promise of holistic management. That's beautiful. Thank you, Pablo. Last question is for Durican. Please tell us your most impactful, rewarding holistic management project. I know you're working on some of the some big ones and you can't talk about all of them, but maybe in general terms. What was your career path 
to working on large scale projects, implementing holistic management. You said you started as a city boy, now you're a master field professional. Maybe you can tell us more about that pathway. Right. Well, actually, I was thinking about um, about that uh, recently. You know, what is the biggest project or what is the biggest undertaking that I've been part of or leading so far? And the, the answer comes to my mind as um, Anatole in grasslands. So now I'm talking not as a not about a project. You know, when we talk about project, we are talking re usually a uh, defined timeline, a defined uh, budget, a defined landscape, and defined set of outcomes that the client or the community or the government whatsoever uh, ask for. Uh, but if I take the question a bit bigger. Uh, you know, when I when I look at the holistic management, what I see is actually management of a complex whole under management without trying to reduce its complexity, without trying to deny its complexity. So when I look at it that way, uh, Antolin Grassland, which is the hub in Turkey, has been so far the, uh, let's say, biggest uh, holistic management project that I have been part of it. And, and why? Because... Uh, you know, especially uh, until like few years ago, uh, this this community of holistic managers uh, was what was not a big one, and it's still not a huge one. We, we know each other. It's a it's it's a it's a nice tribe, and I and I actually love it. Uh, and and but we were we were also all of us from different parts of the world. We were also saying how there will be a very quick uh, change coming when Ricardo, Pablo, you know, all of us actually here are talking about how, for instance, government or young people or uh, companies are really uh, concentrating on holistic management and asking for it, and 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 we knew it, and we were uh, looking for creating an ecosystem of people, teams of people, where everybody could find their niche, you know, how they can be, to what extent they want to be part of that ecosystem, what to put on the table, and how to be part of the movement that, that create beauty all around the planet, not only on the land, but on, on, on humans' life, on economics, like the whole holistic management, whole of it. Um, so for for me, not only grassland has been and still is is such a process. Starting with two young person, me and back then uh, my cousin Volkan, who co-founded the, the the hub with nothing, no land, no money, uh, you know, no information, no skill. But one of the uh, very nice thing was that is that holistic management is very much knowledge and wisdom based. It's not it's not. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I was I was just saying that whole segment is very much wisdom and knowledge based. So um, it's not very dependent on the level of information you have. So it teach you to ask the right question to the right people in the right time for the right reason. Uh, so it's not about like having all the answers. If you would ask me about uh, you know, a livestock uh, breed or a sheep breed in Asia, I will not know it. So, and, and if I live 500 years, I will still not know 1% of the information available in this planet when it comes to land management, soil microbiology, water, uh, you know, hydro, hydrology uh, movements and, and, and everything. But it's more about like really creating an ecosystem where I can have someone to turn and ask the right question to meet my projects or processes needs. So in that case, yes, I mean, now Untold in Grasslands introduced the, the, the word, the concept and the uh, practice of holistic management and of regenerative agriculture in Turkey and in surrounding countries and is now growing a beautiful team of uh, 10 people uh, almost and, and onwards. So for me, that's really the thing that I'm most proud of and I most love. And all the spin-offs, the, uh, let's say, daughter entities that are coming up from, from it, like Safi Mera and so on. Uh, but otherwise, uh, let me just finish in, with one more thing. When it comes to land projects, um, whether you are working with one farmer who owns 30,000 hectare in you know, uh, South America, 
or with uh, let's say 500 or thousand thousands even of pastoralists grazing in the same 30,000 hectare. It's always about working with people. So when you become an AP, you are working with people and more you are willing to see that every person has so much of their context that implies what they do, why they do, as well as so much wisdom and information and, and knowledge that you can tip into. So in one way, the way I approach a project is basically to uh, to, to, to try to understand, to try to look what my assumptions are first about this land. When I go to Mongolia, uh, you know, training process for the herders there, I am thinking what these people may be thinking about me or us about holistic management. What are my assumptions? And then I, and I try to create what are the needs here, where people are, where can I meet them? What are the interventions point? So it's really working, working with people and also growing teams and people, people around projects. Um, I, it was probably not a direct answer to your question, but um, I, to, to me, it's really managing whole uh, complex, complex whole under management. And it's with people, enabling people, trying, finding the ways. As an AP, that's what you do. You find ways and the best leverages to reveal the collective wisdom that can really create beauty on that, on that surrounding. Mm. That gives me the chills. I can't imagine a better way to end this conversation and transition. Thank you so much, Derek. And we're going to open it up to questions from the audience now. So those of you who have stayed with us, thank you so much. And we'll take your questions. I think we want to start with one for, for Helen. Would you like to answer this one from Andy Hope on YouTube? Sure. Thanks, Abby. I, um, yeah, I've, um, I think it's really important to with people when they're talking about their land management to make sure that the animal they have is appropriate for the environment they're in and and really have a, do the good research on that. Um, we ourselves have shifted from a larger animal to a smaller framed animal because we've, with the previous drought that we went through and our the conditions of our landscape, um, we just went, well, let's actually not maintain a bigger, you know, a, you know the biggest animal. Let's bring the size down. So now our cows are 350 to 400 kgs and um, they're or 450 max. And um, it's just a much easier way to, they don't, their the, the nutrient needs aren't as great, um, you know, for a long period of time. So it just means that they're, is, they, they are more adaptable to our conditions and changing conditions. So very good point, Andy. And I think uh, people have to do their own research in their own landscapes about what's the best suited animal. But yeah, that's good. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Helen. This one comes from Jordan, also on YouTube. He says, what has been your biggest aha moment after beginning your holistic management journey? Be it something from the land, people, or systems? Does anyone feel compelled to jump in and answer that question? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Helen. Thank you. So I think uh, I think with that, is it's, it's the realization that the holistic management process is dynamic. So regardless, um, you know, because you've got your context and then the, the actual decision tool uh, with the, the, the questions, the check, checklist really of questions, um, it actually means that um, at any, because you update your context, um, if there's a change of personnel, they get to put their values in. It's always updated and refreshed, but then you're using the same decision-making process. And what I really love about it is that you can have a brainstorming session of all the ideas that might fix a problem or, you know, or address the issue you're trying to deal with. Um, and one will get up, you know, through the process, through the decision-making process towards your context. Um, and then others, you know, you know, may have some question marks and some more research or not quite right at this point in time. But in six months' time, if and the similar, you know, the same sort of idea can be used to solve another issue, it's amazing how that will actually then get up because... The condition that it's it's the right the right decision for right now, and it's always evolving. It, it's always um, it's always current, and I think that's the the really valuable part of the decision making process is the questions we ask um, just sift through and always gives us the right 
right decision for on the day, right now. And it doesn't mean that um, all the other ideas are, are not great because guess what? They'll have their time in the sun potentially in the future um, and, that, and they just roll through. And I think that, that's a really exciting thing. So everyone's listened to and taken seriously. Everyone's heard and everyone feels part of the process. And the process itself sorts, it's, it sorts the, um, the, the best option, uh, not individual egos and agendas, which is a really refreshing way of having a meeting and, and coming to a resolution. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Helen. So true. Getting egos out of the room is, that's, that's the battle. Yeah, that's the, the one once that happens. I want to take this question from Sarah Faye, I think is how you say her last name. This will be our last one and then we'll wrap up. What are your thoughts on how to get a greater percentage of people engaged in training? The psychology, maybe psychology behind that, as not getting the numbers engaged in any ag training we really need to achieve. Pablo, did you want to take that? Yes, I would love to. Uh, we had okay. the same situation a couple of years ago. Uh, they, in 2014, we couldn't open any training because we didn't reach the number of uh, registers. And, and it would grow and this is a common problem. We started to grow when we developed the ability social media. And uh, we started uh, putting content and, and successful cases on uh, social networks. And, and we started doing one day web free. And um, we got to a design of a one day work that has an efficiency, let's say 10%. So you need. 20 registers for your trainings, you need to do a pens to, to to have 200 people so that you can uh, size your communication effort to uh, to the, your capability to, to train people. So, so we, 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 social networks and, and uh, free one day workshops, we started to grow. And now we have really a very successful uh, amount of uh, per year. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Pablo. That's such great uh, advice me, me, conversion. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, was there? Oh, well, just yeah, just a little thing. I think it's also important for sometimes to 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 communicate with people that holistic management is not a training or being a SIAP is not a process if only you are willing to become a rancher or a farmer. Right, holistic management has those great modules on holistic grazing planning, holistic land planning, and holistic ecological monitoring. So it helps tremendously. It, it's the way to go if you are managing a landscape as a biologist, as a farmer, as a rancher, rancher or, or whatsoever. But it's also even for people who are not managing land or who don't foresee them, you know, doing that. But like, let's say a person who is managing his company or her NGO or her family or her uh, community, the decision making framework and all the insights that 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 comes with it. I, I really see, and I personally do a lot uh, work with, with people who do not work directly on a piece of land. And there is a lot of wisdom in that as well. So it's it's not only about if you if you are willing to become a farmer or something, just a just message that we should maybe keep repeating. So true, absolutely true. The decision-making framework is so powerful. And I think we're known so much for grazing because of the origin of holistic management and Alan's TED Talk. Uh, but I completely agree with you. That's wonderful. Unfortunately, we have to wrap. We've been together 90 minutes, if you can believe that. I'd like to share with you my contact information. And we and please join us for a, a monthly meetup. So we host a conversation. We talk more about programs, get to know each other. You get this little taste of being part of the Savory Global Network. So I host those. So please join me there. And then you can also reach out to me at my email here, asmith at savory.global. I'm, help, I'm happy to facilitate an introduction between you and any of our amazing panelists that have joined us today, these incredible leaders across the globe 
the people who are changing the world. It's an honor, honor to work with you. And thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today and prepare so beautifully for this time. Thank you for everything you do. Thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you next time.